today we're going to have our topic being developing an enabling environment for soil and agronomy data in Rwanda. Right, so for today's webinar, we have uh, some really exciting uh, presenters, speakers, our colleagues in the Rwanda CIS project, um, who I'll just introduce to you briefly. Um, we're going to have, uh, uh, we're going to play a, record, a video recording um, from, Mr. Child, um, from Mr. Christian Witt, who is the program officer for Rwanda CIS, responsible, responsible for Rwanda CIS at Belinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, then we're going to have Charles Pachago, who is the Deputy Director of the Rwanda Agricultural Board, um, and he was currently the coordinator for Rwanda CIS. He has an extensive background in research on farming systems in Rwanda, um, particularly with a focus on agroforestry technologies and how they fit well in various biophysical and social economic contexts. Thereafter, we're going to have Mike Rose, who is a CABI associate, who is a CABI associate. Mike has a lot of uh, experience um, coming from his years at the Department of the Environment in the UK government, as well as at the UK Environment Agency. He's, he's also worked a lot at the Open Data Institute and his background is in intellectual property. Thereafter, we're going to have um, Henry, who is a digital development manager here at CABI. Um, his background is in telecommunications engineering. Um, Henry has is, uh, has a lot of experience in ICTs for international development. Uh, Catherine will also be presenting. She is a data analyst and steward at CABI and her background is in biology and conservation sciences. And now uh, since joining CABI, she's been working on a suite of enabling data access projects um, and most recently worked on a review for the CGR's open access and data management policy. And then lastly, we'll have Lusagad Tamani Desta. And Lusagad is a, is a scientist at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, SIAT. Um, we, we're looking forward to what they have to share with us. And to start us off, I'm going to play the recording um, from Christian Witt. for soil and agronomy data sharing. Welcome to the webinar on developing an enabling environment for soil and agronomy data sharing. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, send along some greetings. It's uh, four in the clock in the morning right now. So forgive me for not being there in person, but uh, I uh, would like to share a few reflections on uh, the importance of the topic of the day. As uh, Rwanda is a uh, strategic partner country for us, uh, specifically in the digital pharma services space, uh, we are really uh, excited about this uh, most recent investment with you on the Rwanda Soil Information Service. Um, it is an important uh, asset that you will be building, I feel, uh, that can inform many other use cases and these data sets and assets that you uh, are building and, of course, leveraging all the fantastic work that has been done today uh, will inform a variety of use cases if, as you have mapped out in the proposal. Uh, including uh, uh, monitoring of, uh, of soils, uh, erosion mapping, um, there is solutions around uh, soil fertility issues. So uh, on cases, I'm sure that within a short time, uh, you will be adding other use cases, leveraging the data that you're putting together. Uh, spatial data, but also building up uh, on this data assets in the years to come, uh, maybe revisiting sites and doing more sampling. So you're adding value with time and that will all require um, a, a very organized um, uh, way, not just for conducting the analysis, 
or taking the samples, but also curating these data uh, in, into a database. Now, there's much we have learned in recent years, not only about the technology, uh, as other countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Tanzania, or India, states in India, work this technology. Um, so not just about the technology itself on, on how to implement the, the sampling campaigns and, and doing um, the, the spatial mapping and the soil property predictions and introducing spectroscopy, all these uh, fascinating elements of, of digital soil mapping that allows us to be faster and, and more cost effective. Uh, there's also much we've learned about data use. Kabi has been working with us and our partners in the, on the ground um, in uh, making sure that these data assets that have been built with, uh, with significant uh, uh, public funding, uh, that these data can be used uh, by all the different stakeholders. Uh, including government and policymakers, researchers, private sector partners, or those servicing farmers, um, to make sure that these data are findable, that they are accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that uh, required um, a, an engagement. Uh, with these different stakeholder groups, what I call very hard to implement. So what do I do Monday morning is, is one of the questions that always comes up. And uh, how do you implement? Uh, in, in the case of Ethiopia, for example, after we have done, uh, uh, Kabi colleagues have done uh, uh, really engaging on the ground with, with different stakeholders. There were certain issues flagged, um, like, uh, for example, the wonderful Ethiopian Soil Information Service that has built up the, the soil data. These data were not accessible, not even uh, easily across all, um, all research organizations in the country. And so, uh, working with different partners to get into a comfort zone and getting uh, the right implementation policy in place um, was important. And uh, through this interaction with stakeholders, uh, there was greater realization of, uh, you know, the concerns that may be at the individual level, that the institutional or organizational level and how these concerns can be addressed. Researchers may be concerned about, um, uh, you know, uh, data uh, wanting to be published first, or uh, there were many different concerns that need to be addressed and wrestled to the ground. And this required uh, quite strong leadership at the national level. So uh, what we found useful is um, uh, basically coming together as a community of practice, uh, but the, that requires uh, local champion, a champion in the in the ministry, in the government, or in a key leading research organization, uh, really to champion this process, um, to make sure that all voices are heard, uh, and uh, we realize that the full value of um, uh, these soil information services can really only be uh, explored uh, once. Uh, the data sharing uh, has been clarified and the implementation policies has been in place. Uh, in some cases, I must say, I wish we had done that early at the onset of projects. At times uh, in the beginning, uh, we have invested in soil information services, ignoring this important issue. And uh, it, it uh, uh, then coming back late and trying to retrofit and, and make it happen is much, much harder. Whereas if you were at the onset of building um, the Rwandan Soil Information Service here is a unique opportunity to work together collaboratively to put this uh, data sharing policy and the implementation plan for soil data in place such that all the issues are addressed, and then as you collaboratively build this asset, 
you can move forward knowing that the data are accessible at the right level. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you will have a very uh, fruitful conversation today. Um, so I'm wishing you all the best uh, and um, have a good day. Great, that was, those were some remarks from Christian Bitt. <clears throat> Welcome to everyone who's just joined. Um, I, I would like to mention that this webinar is being recorded. I hope this is okay with everybody, but we are recording it to be able to share with, with you afterwards and all those who were not able to make to the live event. So next I'm going to, I would like to call upon Charles Richagu to present on behalf of the project. Charles, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Chipo, for giving, the, giving me this opportunity. Welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, so, um, I think the Christian has talked about the Rwanda soil information for, for Rwanda. These are projects that he, <clears throat> uh, was approved last year as a funding by uh, Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation. And uh, the, the whole objective is to update the soil information uh, uh, for Rwanda. Uh, I just want to recall that uh, we, uh, we, we, we already have a soil database that was uh, uh, developed uh, in the 80s in Rwanda in collaboration with the uh, Belgian Corporation. Uh, but the current information is, uh, is uh, part of this information is currently outdated and they need to be updated uh, with uh, a lot of issues have happened for the last 20 years. So it makes a lot of sense to review, the, to, re, to update the, dat, the, the data that we have, but also to make sure that the tool or the database that we have can be used for the purpose of uh, supporting ongoing uh, uh, Rwanda development initiative and uh, 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 I, I, would, I would want to refer here to, to the crop intensification program that uh, uh, formed the major part of uh, Rwanda agriculture development uh, process uh, mm -hmm. since 2007. So let's go to the next slide, please. So as I said, there is the rationale behind the Rwanda soil information uh, is that, uh, uh, first of all, we want to look at it as a one of the tool uh, to, to support ongoing agricultural development, agriculture sector growth in this Rwanda because it is regarded as an engine for the economic growth strategy. And the, as I said, we have crop intensification program, which is a strategic tool that is actually driving this uh, transformation process to achieve the 2020 vision of Rwanda. I hope m uh, most of you are aware of this uh, is a vision 2020 and the PSTA4, a strategic plan for trans agriculture transformation. I hope most of you have gone through it. Uh, if not, we can also have a bit of discussion on this. Next. Uh, so the crop intensification program, this is a program that uh, 
was uh, launched or initiated uh, in 2007 as a um, project meant to increase productivity on, on Rwandan soil. Uh, this is a part of agricultural actual sector transformation that the government wanted to, to implement with the view to say that uh, given the context, the specific context of Rwanda with the shortage of land, but with much, much more opportunity for diversifying agriculture, with the diversified agroecological zones that we have in Rwanda, there is a way to diversify agricultural production, but also to increase productivity, given that uh, we, we enjoy for the large part of this country, uh, the uh, rel relatively uh, good rains that we get over two seasons, which is uh, uh, different from what is happening in uh, several African countries. So Rwanda as a country which is blessed with the favorable weather conditions, uh, uh, the, 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 there was a clear, uh, clear um, indication that it, we could do, uh, capitalize on this and increase agricultural production, be it crops or for live, livestock. But uh, of course, the, the, the agricultural sector in this country is uh, still dominated by smallholder farming systems, though we, 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 we the CIP program also aims at uh, pushing for consolidated la consolidation of uh, of land, uh, uh, which actually is is a, is a strategy to increase productivity on a larger scale. Uh, so we are talking about economic of scale. So what actually happened that uh, uh, Rwanda is 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 known to have. Uh, um, agriculture organized in small pieces of land owned by farmers. So if you have a picture of Rwanda in your, in your flight uh, coming or uh, approaching Rwanda, you will see from the, the top, uh, from the sky, that there is a different division of land. It's very much scattered. So for the for the for the consolidation of the crop intensification to happen, we actually needed to bring together these pieces of land, make it larger, and then do a bit of con intensification. When you talk about intensification, you talk about use of good seeds, use of a fertilizer, but also mechanization that actually can be done on a larger scale, not on smaller scale. So what happens with the land consolidation in these countries is that the farmers keep the right to their, to their land, but they, they organize in such a way farmers that are close to each other decide to grow the same crop, uh, harmonize, uniform, uh, make, make it uniform, the management of the land, planting at the same time, applying fertilizer at the same time, do all agricultural practices at the same time with a view to increase the productivity, but also uh, uh, targeting the market uh, to make sure that uh, we, we hit the objective of food security, but we make sure that we produce the surplus for, for the market. So uh, one of the issues that uh, uh, coming back to this project, the, the issue that we needed to address with the Rwasis is the, the issue regarding low, uh, low soil nutrient, but also fertilizer application, uh, simply because the, the, soil, the soil fertility represent a major component of, of agricultural production. Uh, but if you look at the, the distribution of nutrient concentration across the country, you will see that there is a, a bit of uh, diversity in terms of content of nutrient, but also deficiency level, depending, uh, uh, changing or varying from one location to another. 
which means we have a country with diversified uh, type of soil, diversified types of crops with the different uh, nutrient requirements that require uh, 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 developing uh, uh, fertilizer rates that fit with the specific conditions. So here we are talking about yield gap for a different location due to a specific uh, soil uh, nutrient depletion or acidity or soil erosion. So Rwanda is a, is a uh, landscape is dominated by slippy slope, which makes erosion uh, control, it, it actually is a must to, 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 to for, for, for us to increase the productivity. So two, two major issues, soil fertility, but also soil erosion that need to be properly controlled. So because of this, we still have yield gap that we see on this graph, uh, this, this is a histogram that you see. Uh, so we, we have here a number of commodities, maize, rice, cassava, Irish potato, wheat, banana, and, and the banana. So, so in the blue histogram, this is a national average uh, of what we get at national level. And the red, we have the large scale, these are the large scale farmers, yeah, the yield that we, we, we've corrected with recorded in 2018 A season for large scale farmers. And the, 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 the green one, we have the potential that you can achieve. So we see that in the, all commodities, actually, we, we are not yet uh, where we want to be. Uh, for instance, for, for maize, uh, the, the, the average for the countries, we still, we still at 1.5 tons per hectare. Uh, this is the average across the region, across the country. But if you move to large scale farmers, this is the farmers who are actually operating on consolidated land. We can get 2.5 tons per hectare, but yet the potential is seven tons per hectare. But uh, uh, I, I, must, I must clarify here that uh, we have several farmers who have been able to achieve even a seven to eight tons per hectare using hybrid seed, uh, but we, we still have many more, many more farmers are still uh, using um, low performing uh, varieties that, uh, and the current SIP is to pull these few big farmers to make sure that they, they fill the gaps. Next. So this is a gap uh, map uh, showing the situation of soil acidity and this country. So you see that more than 50% actually of Rwandan soil is acidic with a pH of less than 5.5. These are, so, these are area with uh, red colors, red and, and yellow colors. Uh, so it varies between strong to extreme acid, acidic levels. So you can see the magnitude of the problem that actually uh, contribute to, to bring down the yield. Uh, so in this uh, uh, slide, we are uh, showing the situation of soil erosion near Rwanda, in Rwanda. And we have about seven, uh, 500 hectares, 500,000 hectares highly exposed to soil erosion with uh, associated nutrient losses and uh, so the, the, the control of soil erosion is a prerequisite for us to increase. We expect that the, the fertilizer and the other inputs that are being used are, the, are put to good use. Next. So uh, BASIS actually aims at uh, addressing issues of soil acidic, uh, uh, soil fertility, low soil fertility, but also uh, erosion by developing a site uh, and the crop specific recommendation. Uh, 
but uh, the project will build on the foundation on all the, 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 the achievement that uh, the country has already achieved. So among these, we are talking about the, the investment that were made by the government of Rwanda in terms of uh, controlling the soil erosion. Uh, so there are some investment were done in terms of construction of radical terracing uh, that uh, have actually significantly reduced. So the project will, will, will actually build on that and try to see the future investment that needed to be made in terms of uh, controlling soil erosion and the proposed soil erosion management plan. Next. So the objective of the project is to provide information, evidence for improving agricultural productivity, sustainable development, land use, and we, we, we are going to build, uh, to, to, to operate around the three specific objective. First is to build, uh, to develop site crop specific uh, fertilizer and lime recommendation. Uh, to do a, 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 a comprehensive mapping of different soil forms in Rwanda and propose a management investment plan. And at the end, we aim also to develop a soil information system that will help us to monitor the effect of investment, soil fertility management, but also provide the information and the consistent evidence base for future investment. Next. Uh, so uh, in terms of implementation, uh, the project is led by RAB with the support of a number of partners, including AFSIS, ECRAF, ITA, and ISRIC. Of course, CABI as well. It was not mentioned here, but CABI also is part of this. And the three main use cases are going to be uh, our major focus. Uh, and these were actually um, identified by RAB through consultation with the key stakeholders, including partners, including development partners, including scientists, including uh, ministries. Uh, next, next, next slide, please. So the first use cases is, is, is actually connected with the three pro specific objective. First is to de develop fertilizer and lime uh, recommendation to help fertilizer and lime suppliers to develop formulas. Uh, so why? Uh, so 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 we think that fertilizer and lime re uh, rate recommendation is a prerequisite for us to, to, to make sure that we avail tool, not only for farmers to know exactly what the correct rate are, but also to use it as a tool for planning. Planning because of uh, Minister of in, uh, uh, Economic, Economy and Finance need actually this tool to ensure that a proper budget is, is a plan to make sure that fertilizer and lime are availed to the farmers. Uh, so for your information is that uh, fertilizer and lime are actually uh, distributed to farmers here under subsidy model. So government is putting money to support uh, farmers to get fertilizer and lime at, a, at a affordable Post. So we, we, we are regarding this as a tool for planning, but also a tool to help farmers, but also the ministry to increase the productivity that you are talking about. Secondly, the project will also produce information on different type of soil and mapping erosion occurrence in the three main agroecological zones of Rwanda. For, the, for this specific case, we are going to work closely with the Ministry of Agriculture, but also Ministry of Environment that actually is dealing with the 
uh, control of soil erosion uh, in this country. As I mentioned before, a lot of investment has been done in the past and the investment were made to increase, to upscale uh, uh, construction of radical terracing at this country. So the Guasis would actually co uh, contribute in mapping those areas, but also identifying other areas that need further investment and uh, make, make sure that the, the, the type of investment that are required are, are, are actually well documented and, 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 and made available. But also we want to, to look at uh, what this infrastructure may, may uh, what is the correct fertilizer application that would be uh, uh, recommended for this specific area where uh, uh, terraced, terraced area, uh, 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 because these are areas that need further, inv uh, further investment to, in to ensure uh, soil fertility is restored, but also is increased. Uh, next. Uh, the last one is to develop a functional interactive national soil and landscape information system. So these these ones, we wanted to have a sort of uh, a decision support tool to help the ministry, but also other partners to ensure that we, we monitor the changes on our soil, but also we be able to update whatever information that is needed. And we, we think that this tool will help us to, to adjust our soil information systems over time to make it the, the process more sustainable, but also to enable the ministry to build the capacity to develop, to, to monitor what is happening in terms of changes or dynamic in soil fertility uh, issues in this country and make appropriate decision. Next. So uh, very briefly, we are indicating here what are the users of this information. So we want what is really to make, to be, a, to generate tools or to generate um, uh, uh, output should be able to serve for a purpose. So we, we, we aim at producing uh, uh, documents or uh, tools that would help the, uh, the, 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 uh, the stakeholders, but also the policymakers to make sure uh, appropriate decisions are made. So first of all, we have the Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources that is going to, major, to be the major um, beneficiary of these projects. We have fertilizer blending companies that are very much interested to, 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 to match what the farmers need with what, the, 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 what, 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 is, the soil, what is the soil requirement in terms of fertilizer and what, is the, what the crops needs, but also to make sure that what the plant, the farmers needs are, are actually um, taken care in their operations or in their produ production plants. Mm -hmm. So we have lime suppliers also, because lime also will be part of the, the uh, part of the investigation by the project. We have the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning. As I mentioned before, we get a budget to finance the, the agriculture sector through the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. So these tools will help us to do a strategic budgeting in this context. Next. So on, 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 on the side of partnership, as I mentioned, we're going to collaborate with a number of, uh, of, 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 of partners both nationally but also internationally. Uh, we have AFC, CCRAF, ISRIC, CABI, and the ITA. 
nationally, we're going to, to partner with the University of Rwanda and the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. And next. So for the sustainability, uh, we, we plan to have WASIS as a project that is going to stay even after the project, the, the, the funding, and be integrated into the ministry to make sure that it gets a budget from the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. But as I mentioned, if, if we make sure that the, our operation or our, um, uh, uh, our model is actually understood by all the stakeholders at the early stage of project implementation. So to, it's going to be much, much easier for us to really to have it integrated in the ministry, the ministry uh, uh, structure. So we, we, we want this tool to be part of the, the, the future plan of the ministry, but also serve different stakeholders uh, in the agriculture sector. Next. So thank you very much. Uh, so I, I make sure that the, my presentation is brief. Maybe you can get time and discuss more. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Charles. Um, thank you for that overview and um, reinforcing again the objectives of the project. Right, so now we'll move on to the next part of the webinar. Okay, I hope you can see. Right. Um, we'll just take one minute to, to, to also capture some of your feedback. Um, the, the session we're about to, to go into is going to talk more about the work we are doing to assess the landscape, the, the soil and agronomy data landscape in Rwanda. And we've been conducting various activities that my colleagues will talk about, uh, interviews and surveys and so forth. Um, this is just a quick activity to capture from you, the audience who are here today. Tell us um, what, what from your experience and work in Rwanda and assessing, you know, the, the, the landscape from your own work, what, what sort of challenges and barriers do you mostly face when you're accessing or sharing um, soil and agronomy data? This is just a quick activity for you to indicate by a, use a tick box, a tick, a check mark, a tick mark um, against which one you think here is, is, is a key challenge for you. Okay, so it could be technical barriers that you face, um, maybe a skills gap or lack of infrastructure. Is it cultural? Mm -hmm. Is it an issue of attitudes and behaviors? Or is it around ethical um, issues and aspects to data sharing? Um, is it institutional barriers? Maybe there's lack of finance, budgetary support in your organization or the organizations that you see. Or could it be a political uh, matter where you, know, you have you know, conflicting maybe national policies or conflicting donor policies. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you can, if you, if you, if you're struggling to find the annotate button, it's right at the top, drop down, annotate. If anyone still wants to, to contribute. Okay. Right, so from the looks of it, for those who did, it's about cultural, there are more cultural barriers than the other categories. Okay, this is something we will explore more in depth as we go on and we, we, we will reach out to you and hopefully you can give us feedback in, in, in the form of interviews and so forth. Okay, a few more people. Yeah, if you want to log in your answer, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you could just turn off that function annotate so that you don't accidentally annotate the rest of the slide, that would be great. Okay. So Mike, Mike Rose, are you ready? Um, you'll be our next presenter. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, let me just 
Let's see if I can turn my video on. Hello, hopefully you can see me now. Uh, you might have seen me popping up a little bit earlier in the middle of Christian's introduction. Um, that's a, a danger of not pressing the mute button when you're recording somebody uh, for, for, a, for a thing like this. Um, so, hi, thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, Rwanda, the Rwanda CIS, so RASIS and the enabling environment. So trying to focus in on the piece of work that CABI in particular is, is here to try and do. Um, cool, uh, next slide. So what I'm going to take you through in the next sort of 10 minutes or so is sort of talk about what, what, what an enabling environment is. Um, so I use this term quite regularly, but it, it's in, I think it's important to everybody really gets an idea of what, what I'm talking about. Um, how that links to the concept of fair data, which if you haven't heard about heard of before, I will talk about very briefly. Um, and then uh, what we're planning on doing in the project, what Cabby are doing, and then how, how you can help. This was never going to be a, a one-way thing where we just broadcast stuff to you. We're actually uh, interested in how you can help us um, and the important, as suggested by Christian right at the start, it's really important that you do help us in developing the, the right enabling environment for ROASIS to be successful. Um, if you can click onto the next slide, that'd be great. Just while you did that, I went in and cleared all the ticks off the screen. So from the over diligent um, annotating, so that's done now. Um, so just to sort of summarize what Charles took us through, um, the, sort of the, the last bit of Charles's presentation a, a moment ago. Um, there's a, the, the project that, that we're involved in has a, a series of outcomes and there's the fertilizer recommendations that are, that are needed, there's the line recommendations, there's erosion mapping, but there will be others that, that uh, all underpinned by the data that will be contained within ROASIS, so which will be the, the soil and landscape information system. Um, it, it's really important to realise that the, the link between the data, be, the data that's being collected and that data then being used to create the information that helps make the, deci the, the decisions. So it, the, the importance of the, the data collection cannot, cannot be underestimated. So I just wanted to highlight that actually all of the things that we're trying to do are underpinned by the data that's going to be held in RASIS. Next slide, please, Jupo. Um, I just wanted to introduce also at this point something which you'll all probably be familiar with, but a, this is a really simplified data lifecycle. So not only is having the data important, but how you collect it and how it's stored and then how it's used and shared is equally important um, as, as just, ha just having it. Uh, the data moves within uh, ROASIS like this. So somebody will go out into the field, they will collect data in a particular way. They will then use the database system to store it. And then the database system will then enable them to share it. Um, how it does that's really important. And this is where it links to fair data. So I will digress slightly into fair data for a moment. Um, so fair data came about, um, I can't remember exactly when, but it was in the, over the last 10 years as a concept. Um, and, and, and it was mainly around research data, but I think it, it applies equally to any data that's collected for any purpose. And that is that data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. There's uh, quite a lot of content that you can find on the internet and in different places around um, what what each of these mean and the uh, huge loads of guidance about um, what, what you need to do underneath each of those. But personally, I like to look at them kind of like at face value. You can kind of understand what each word means just by reading it. So data needs to be findable. So once it's created, somebody else needs to be able to find it. Once it's created and, and they can find it, it then needs to be accessible. So people need to know that they can access it and how it, how it can be accessed. It needs to be interoperable. So it's Whilst sharing PDF maps is one way of sharing data, that's not really interoperability. Um, the, the, the idea is that da data will be machine readable, it will be usable by uh, multiple operators in different, different ways. And then finally, and probably for me the most important one, because it's the bit where my background comes in, is that data needs to be reusable. So it's, it's great to actually have the data, 
um, and it's great to have it stored in the system, but the important bit is making sure that the data, once it's collected, can be reused by everybody. Uh, so if you just think about the data lifecycle I mentioned a moment ago, and think about FAIR data, you'll probably see that it's important that you're thinking about all of these elements across that life cycle to make sure that data can be used and then reused and built upon. Um, data uh, often is an input, data that's an output and is shared is then an input to another project or another piece of work which then goes around the cycle again and if at any point that that cycle breaks um, then you can't get the, the re maximum return from having that data available so you can't then go and do the kind of analysis and gather the insights that you want so that's the, the importance for of fair across that life cycle uh, can you have the next slide cheapo I'll just go back in and clear all the drawings from whoever it is that's graffitiing me. Um, so just sort of to draw those two things together. Uh, fair, uh, so the date, sorry, the, just to draw those two things together. The, the database is actually part of the system. So Roasis as a thing sort of, sort of starts to focus on the, uh, the storage of data. Um, the, in order to implement FAIR, we need to look across not just the storage, but how data is collected and created and used and shared with those kind of concepts. But what I wanted to emphasize with this slide is that those um, actions that people take if, when they collect and create data and when they use and share data are the key bits. Those actions and the decisions that are made have to be fair in order to make this life cycle work and the data to be shared and used and built upon. Um, the decisions that are made enable um, the sort of like the generation of the information um, that Charles was mentioning around, let's say fertilizer recommendations and, and the such like, it, it's important that the right choices are made. Um, I also wanted to just touch on at this point that um, this is not a new concept to Rwanda, and I know that. Um, we've complete uh, looked at the data revolution policy, for example, and part of, part of the data revolution policy is about how it gets applied. Um, and what we're trying to do and what we're starting to think about, about here is how some of the elements of the data revolution policy get applied specifically to Rwasis. Um, so how can we make sure that that, that, that that works? So next slide, please. So just to really labor this point um, uh, and my, one of my standard pictures of a lot of Lego people, the enabling environment around Rwasis that we are interested in helping develop and we're helping work uh, create is all around people the people are key to any change so as charles outlined there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and that da data is needed to, to to be used to make those decisions but getting to that place is a change um, and people have to decide to make that change and in order to do that it's important that people have rules that they need to follow and they understand that those rules exist and they understand that they need to follow them. But in order to have those rules, it's really important that there's leadership in setting them up, creating them, um, owning them and making sure that people follow them. Uh, it's important that there's advocates, um, so people that uh, understand the benefit of having those rules, following them and the, the ultimate outcome of having the rules in place, which is more information, better information, better decisions. And then you need a group of people that are willing to comply with the rules. Um, it's all well and good having a big stick to beat people up, up with, but if people uh, don't agree with them, don't understand them, don't see the benefit to themselves of what those rules are, then generally what you see is people passively resisting them. Um, so it, it's, it's not good enough just to have a set of process documentation or laws or policies that people are supposed to follow, you then need to follow that up by helping people understand what the benefit to them is of following these rules, what, what they'll get out of sharing things. Um, so next slide, please. So just to sort of really emphasize, so what are CABI here to do? So CABI have been asked to be involved in this project um, to help with this uh, framework and this enabling framework around um, the, the people and the processes that are needed to help the people understand what they need to do to implement ROASIS and get the benefit that has been outlined in the project. 
So we're here to help develop a framework. We're here to help identify these groups of people. So identify the leadership. Who is the accountable people that will lead, lead us to this uh, new place where data can be shared and used in the right ways? We, we're here to help um, identify the processes that might be needed and the sort of training and the education that might be uh, needed around those and then help draft the sort of start the starter processes for people to consider um, what we're not here to do and it's worth just emphasizing what we're not here to do we're not here to do the data analysis work and create maps with we, and we, we're not here to do do those kind of things we're very much here to help enable Roasis to um, to work but then importantly uh, next slide we need you as well so we cannot come in um, and start a series of uh, developing a series of process documents and then send them to you and expect that you're going to follow them and understand them we really need your help um, to make the uh, Rawasis yours um, we need in input on um, how data sharing principles are created so we we've got a uh, some, some kind of like guidelines that we can follow and um, those principles need to be specific to Rwanda uh, it's no good me saying that I've worked for the UK government um, here's some principles that work for the UK government they'll work in Rwanda because because they probably won't the context is different so we need to bring our experience and expertise from other contexts and share it with you and then work with you to help develop the right things and products for you once we've done that we're here to help uh, work. we need your help to co-develop the processes that we need to make sure that they work and then we need your help to sort of understand what the ecosystem is that we're working in um, especially with the, the restrictions on travel and the, the, the issues around the COVID-19 um, obviously we can't come in country uh, can't fly out from the UK and come in, into country um, so we need your help in understanding who are the people we need to talk to so what we would normally do in a workshop we need people to help us with um, and then this is my final slide you'll probably be pleased to hear so we'd like you to start helping us straight away really um, we we have started to draft um, some data sharing principles for oasis the idea is that these are very high level um, these are uh, things that people would just just agree with that, that there's no kind of shouldn't be anything contentious in here um, these are these are drafted based on a bit of not uh, knowledge and experience from working in other contact context but also building on the data revolution policy and taking specific elements out of that and trying to apply them in, in this context um, what they are just you, you can follow this link um, which appears on every single slide so if you don't catch it now the, the links in the bottom left hand corner of this slide follow that link and it will take you to a, a document which will link set give you links to other places one of which will be the, the data change principles for you to comment on um, just to sort of trail what what you'll find there um, things like data, data about Rwanda should be held and accessible in Rwanda. Data should be uh, in Rwanda should be fair. Um, the value to the people that are participating should be obvious. Um, and if people are using somebody else's data, then recognition should be given to where the data comes from. It's just a sort of like an, a highlight of, of what will be within those uh, principal documents. But yeah, as I said, your help is critical to making these real. Um, if, if you don't help, then they will just be um, a, a set of uh, draft principles forever. Um, Chico, next slide, please. I think that's the end. Yeah, so um, if you've got any questions about what I've just said there, please feel free to um, put them into the chat for the, the, the overall um, webinar, and we'll answer, try and answer them either at the end or we'll definitely follow up um, and answer them. Or if you want to drop me a, a drop me an email, and my email address is there, and I'm more than happy to speak to anybody or e have an email exchange with anybody about uh, what I've just talked about. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Yeah. So uh, another little activity. Um, this is a question, so it's a broad question, but based off of what Mike has been talking about, you know, the importance of people. People are the ones who make the choices, but they need processes to follow, they need leadership and so forth. So what do you think? What, what, what needs to be in place to make data sharing easier? Can you just go, go back again to that annotate feature and type in, use the text uh, option to type in what you think, or we'll just do, give you one minute, reflect, 
uh, and just type in what you think needs to be in place in terms of people, in terms of processes. It could be people, it could be a certain role. There needs to be these types of roles in place. There needs to be, if you know someone specifically you want to put there. No, no, no. So actually, I think there's a text option. So you don't need to choose between the two, but uh, actually you type something. I hope that that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So clear named leadership role from within RAB. Great. Processes, cent a centralized database with clear data access process. Keep them coming, folks. Community of practice. Mm, definitely. I think we will hear more from uh, Losegard when he presents the importance of having a community uh, around this. Right? Simple technology. Hmm. Okay. Okay. 30 more seconds. We're going, going, going. Incentives. Nice. Yeah. I think we've got a lot of cross learning to do amongst the projects that we are working on. So we've got a bit of research work we've done for another project around incentives. So we will be bringing components of that in. Okay. Right, so moving right along. So we don't, um, <clears throat> if you have, you know, if you still have burning uh, things you would like to discuss with us, definitely we'll give you the opportunity to sign up for an interview and then we can carry out carry on the discussion directly with you. So moving on, um, I'm going to bring in Henry, um, who's going to present Henry and Catherine. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chipo. So uh, basically, for this uh, presentation, I'll uh, briefly talk about the Rwanda landscape and let in uh, my colleague Catherine to take you through what we have done under the land, landscape analysis. So the aim of conducting a landscape analysis uh, is to get an overview and an and understanding of how data flows in Rwanda. And also what agricultural and soil data already exist, because that is really key to understand the different kinds of data which exist, who have access to it and how they gain access to it. And uh, I think my pres uh, the, the presenters have mentioned that uh, to develop a data storage and sharing system, in this case, uh, Rwandasis, it requires the input of uh, different stakeholders. It also requires the input of potential users of the system. And for example, the, the users could be soil scientists, uh, policymakers, uh, researchers, data scientists, etc. And uh, in order to make Rwandasis work for all stakeholders, we require input from stakeholders. And I would say throughout this project, you are VVIP, very, very important people who will contribute to this project. So what we have done so far is to understand and identify the key stakeholders in uh, soil and agronomy landscape. Now, like uh, my colleague Catherine to just take you through, present the findings from the research, and I'll chip in to show you the ecosystem map, map what we have done under the ecosystem map, where we have uh, mapped all the stakeholders, and lastly, provide uh, channels for feedback, where you can give us uh, feedback through either surveys, uh, through inter interviews, etc. Catherine, please do that. Sorry, we can't hear you, Catherine. I think you might be muted or... Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, hi. Um, 
so yeah, just a quick word about the ecosystem map. So this is a way for us to kind of visualize how data flows um, and what some of the kind of relationships are, what exists in Rwanda currently. Um, with consultation with you, we'll develop some kind of understanding about what the barriers to this kind of data flow are currently. And that enables us to provide that support with the processes, the people that is fit for context. Um, next slide, please, Chipo. Um, so to do this currently, we've had um, we've been interviewing people, so we've only had four so far, but really keen to do some more. Um, and we've done a literature review looking at kind of papers, strategy documents, reports um, from in country. So next slide, please. So yeah, this is just a very high level presentation of the results. Um, there is a lot going on in Rwanda. It's clearly the place to be. Um, there's a lot of kind of government departments, uh, NGOs, funders. There's a lot of kind of repositories and databases present. Um, they seem to be quite siloed from, from, the, outs from the outside, I should say. Um, so it's kind of unclear how, what those data relationships are. There does seem to be political will, so that kind of data revolution policy um, to kind of integrate these and, and enable data to, to flow kind of more readily. Um, agriculture is the biggest sector, so it's maybe not surprising that it's so diverse. And as Charles has said, that there have been some soil mapping activities that have been conducted. Soil data collection is happening, but these efforts aren't necessarily aligned and data maybe isn't, isn't shared. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, just that kind of bright, broader national context. So Charles mentioned in his introduction, the Vision 2020 and the Smart Rwanda Master Plan. So there seems to be kind of a, a centralized push to kind of transform the Rwandan economy to one that is kind of digital tech led. And this led to this, this data revolution policy that we've brought up a couple of times. From that as well, there seems to be, oh, sorry, Chipa. So there seems to be a national data portal being developed. Um, whether Rwanda assists, the expectation is that that will feed into that or otherwise um, is less clear. The National Institute for Statistics and Research seem to be the primary departments involved in that work. Um, what was kind of exciting about this is when Charles was talking about agriculture being the engine for this uh, kind of transformation, that Rwanda CIS is a really good opportunity to do that. And that if we are intentional about aligning with this vision, it could be a real strong use case to elsewhere in government, elsewhere in Rwanda. This is how you implement this kind of national vision. So it's quite exciting to see that kind of context there. Um, next slide, please. So it seems the um, image isn't there, but I will click through to the ecosystem map in a minute and show you. But there are a lot of databases, it seems, within the agriculture sector. So things like AMIS, ALICE, um, SNS call centre, all of these different kind of Minagri managed databases are all contain data. Um, there's a lot of NGOs in the country collecting data, but again, how is this integrated? What are, the, what are the barriers that exist? And how can we prevent them from affecting Rwandasis? There does seem to be a plan for a kind of centralized um, data warehouse. So that would be the S. AIS, the Smart Agriculture Information Service, and that seems to want to kind of integrate these different databases and whether ROASIS will feed into that. Uh, again, good to hear thoughts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so soil data itself, um, so Charles has mentioned a couple of efforts in his introduction. So I think maybe the CPR, the carte pédologique, um, was what he was discussing that uh, soil mapping activity in the kind of late 80s. Um, again, who has access to that is, is maybe not clear. If I am a researcher at the University of Rwanda, how do I get access to the CPR? Should I need it? If I'm a fertilizer company, can I get access to the information contained in there? Um, there seemed to be a caravan project, which was last year, which looked at kind of capacity development and, and kind of building mobile soil data collection. But again, who who has access to that data, who needs it, um, is, is maybe less clear. Um, I think what I'll do now is, is share my screen and show you the ecosystem map. So, um. uh, just, just to comment something on uh, the databases, the different databases which exist 
I think it's really key to have integrations where as we develop systems, even uh, we are developing that one does this, we need to make sure that these uh, systems can communicate where we are able to integrate, use APIs so they can communicate. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. If we are able to make these systems communicate, that would be great. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Being really intentional about, intentional about what already exists and how can we design Rowasis so that it's, it's kind of feeding into this existing system. Um, so the ecosystem map should be on your screen now. I'm aware it's a lot to take in. Um, so we'll, we'll share the link with you after. I'll, I'll just give a quick introduction for how to navigate that. Um, so you can see all of the different stakeholders here. Um, the arrows signify a relationship. It would be really good to hear from you what the, those relationships are. How does the data flow if it does? If it doesn't, why not? Um, you can click on um, an element and you can see at the side here there are three dots. If you open that, there will be some information in there about that specific element. Some of them are not complete um, because I couldn't find enough kind of research about them, but if you could provide further clarity on those, that would be valuable too. Um, what else do you need to know? You can kind of focus in on a specific group. So if we take RAB, um, on the right-hand side, there is a focus button and we can just kind of look at the relationships that RAB has. So if you are a member of RAB and you want to focus in on there and you have more ideas about more linkages that could happen, um, that, that's kind of how you do that. So that's kind of, if you could uh, share the slides again, Chipo. That's kind of the picture that we've developed so far through the literature. Um, aware it's, it's not complete. I'm sure people who were actually work in Rwanda have got a lot of thoughts about that. Um, we'll provide you some kind of channels for feedback on it. So we would like to do a workshop with you where we develop that and, and we will invite you all to that. The interviews that we're conducting um, are a good opportunity for you to kind of give some more clarity on that picture and we'll provide a link for you to register for those. Um, a questionnaire, we'll send that around. Um, and again, that will be gathering more information about that. Um, and a report, so a kind of two pager, which we will publish online and you can comment and suggest edits to that. Um, so that's me, thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so, Great, thanks a lot for taking us through the data landscape as it as it stands as it looks at the moment. And we really, like Catherine says, look forward to engaging with you in, to validate it, to add more, find what the gaps are, and um, really give a good reflection, uh, an accurate reflection of of the landscape. So now I'll call upon uh, Dr. Lusagad to make his presentation. He's going to talk about. Um, similar initiative in Ethiopia and the experience that they've had. So if you can please unmute yourself, I will share your presentation now. Okay, th uh, thanks Chipo. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Lul Sakat from uh, Ethiopia. I work with uh, the Alliance of uh, Biodiversity and SEAT. Thanks for inviting me to present our experience related to data sharing and uh, data access in Ethiopia the last few years. Uh, I think there is a lot of similarity in uh, between Rwanda and Ethiopia and also all the presentations I listened some of them have already passed through those steps. So I think it will be very interesting um, exercise to share our experiences. We, uh, we have started the, the, the exercise around uh, five years ago, uh, aimed to discuss on developing site and context specific tools to target fertilizer application to address uh, the huge yield gap in the country 
This is an example of wheat uh, which was done a few years ago. And there is a huge yield gap uh, in the country and there is a need to, to fill that gap. And the clear determinants are climatic and mostly rainfall, uh, rainfall and fertilizer. Uh, low use of fertilizer and also unbalanced use, in most cases, uh, blanket recommendation. Uh, and therefore, we, we say there is a need to develop something. And during our discussions with uh, different ex partners and experts, we realized that uh, we don't have uh, the necessary data. Uh, next slide, please. So we know that data is important, but we cannot find the data at the relevant uh, or at the appropriate place with the appropriate uh, resolution. Next slide. Uh, so, that, so what we needed to do was to, to look for options of getting data so that we can make better decisions based on knowledge and experiences from analytical skills. We know that there are more than 60 years of work on crop response to fertilizer application and recent work by the Agricultural Transformation Agency, which uh, led ETOCs, has done a lot of work, a very tremendous work on soil mapping and also some demonstrations. But still, accessibility was a challenge for, for better use of those data sets. Uh, next slide. So, SIAT uh, were supported by GIZ, started exploring on how we can promote, start and promote data sharing and access. So initially, it was a very serious uh, challenge. It was not really possible to bring on many supporters in that area. So that access was like, you know, you know very, a very controversial issue in the country. So we started bilateral discussions and some institutional discussions. And then when we know that there are some interested groups, we invited for a short workshop for a group of people to discuss on the way forward uh, about in around uh, 2015 in October. And those discussions, that discussion really created awareness among members. And we in principle agreed that there should be a way to, to you know, initiate this data access and sharing in the country by bringing data sets together in a centralized system and doing the right analysis. So the first step we said was because it was not possible to get a current uh, adequate data sets, we said let's collect what is available you know, through publications. There are a lot of publications in scientific literature and we said why don't we bring those data sets and do some kind of analysis as a demonstration for those uh, other institutions and partners that having a larger data set can, can mean better and a lot. So that really was an eye opener and we made some presentations uh, in 2016 on a meta-analysis where we have uh, very good presentations and even local partners were invited to, to present their reviews and we published their work in a special issue uh, in National Journal as an incentive for their effort. Next slide. Uh, then with that review data set, we, we created a quick database. So this was the initial one. So our effort is to demonstrate what is possible. So we, in, we create awareness among other colleagues so that they can also be ready to share and support what we are trying to do. And that exercise, we hosted the database uh, for different crops based on those uh, reviewed uh, data sets. And the EIAR, EIAR is the uh, Ethiopian Institute of Agriculture Research, so they lead the uh, research exercise. Next slide. Then the next one is, okay, we have some data sets now that are that's available, and also we are negotiating with different colleagues to get data, but we have to show why do we need that data and why do we need larger data sets. So we organized a, a national workshop on big data analysis and data sharing. So we invited experts uh, from abroad, from within Ethiopia, and we presented different experiences on big data analysis and data access benefits and so on. 
So that was also a very inspiring discussion for senior agronomists and soil scientists in the country to see what can be possible. And then during that discussion, uh, we, there was a group uh, who, who showed greater interest and we wanted to maintain uh, our uh, start, our activity, and there was, we suggested to create a coalition of the willing because among the close to 90 people, there were some significant amount who are interested Few were still debating on, on, on data sharing. So we said we have to create a coalition of the willing. And these are uh, individuals and institutions who are willing to support, to provide their data through a formal data sharing uh, platform and also to support what we are trying to do. So that was a very great initiative. And we asked people to sign up. And a lot of around 45 people signed up. So that, that time, we have uh, formed the uh, Coalition of the Willing in 2018, which achieved a lot of work, which I will present some of them. Uh, next slide. And so now, in the, after a year, the task force was given, uh, sorry, the coalition uh, identified some key intervention areas. Number one is to create awareness uh, among different colleagues, institutions, and offices on data sharing, and also to make sure that we use the data sets appropriately and intelligently to support uh, government uh, planning and decisions. Then there was a discussion to form a task force because we have around 40, 50 people as members of coalition. So for proper management, we need a few people who can also lead uh, the task force uh, as a team. So the, sorry, the coalition. So the task force around seven people we, there was a criteria who should be the member of the task force uh, and, and then we identified from research, from international, from universities, seven people. So the task force were asked to give some mission. Uh, some of them are like they have to facilitate and coordinate activities of the coalition, collect further data and develop guidelines on data sharing because we still don't have data even though we received some data from colleagues. As you see on the right side, the red and the other colors, the red color is by members of the coalition who joined lately, and the first one, the others are those collected during the review. And also we agreed that we have to contribute to the national data sharing policy. So with this uh, development, coalition members provided more data and we also provide training for uh, members of the coalition who provide the data. So this was also another incentive we uh, invited experts and around uh, 22 people were trained, first of all in data preparation, data exploration, and the second one in further more advanced data analytics. And their works, work or publications are, are, are going to be uh, you know, published in a special issue, around four or five papers. So that was a, a good step where we created a task force and we started to build capacity. And the second, next slide, uh, then the, through this coalition exercise, the government was aware on what we tried to do. And some of us were uh, identified, selected to be task force for the national uh, system. So they, mean, they named it the task force as well. So the state minister appointed around seven, five to six people to lead uh, data sharing policy development for the Ministry of Agriculture. So that was very, very important because we have somehow influenced this, this, uh, this exercise. And uh, then the next activity was we, we, we during our uh, trainings and uh, different exercises, we identified that there are still a lot of data sets in different places, but still we don't know, you know, who really has what kind of data. So we, we call it data ecosystem mapping. And we tried to, you know, identify who, which institution or which individual has which kind of data. And we developed a template and we assigned someone to collect, uh, you know, to go and uh, review who has what data in what format, uh, are they georeferenced? Uh, what are the units used? And so on and so forth. 
and the huge data, a huge set was identified, a long set of uh, Excel sheets with so many partners having different types of data sets. And uh, there are some questions asked whether they can share the data sets uh, or not. More than 40% said they, are, they will agree to share the data if we, if we ask them to, if we provide or request them officially. So that was a, an interesting intervention uh, what that we did. And then uh, the next slide, the next exercise we did is we, during our training exercise and our analysis, we observed that data have different formats. The, so the, there are some the units used, the locations, the way they are prepared. It was very difficult to make uh, analysis or at least it takes a long time to prepare the data set. So we said, why not we devise or develop a guideline on data uh, standardization, data collection. So even the, part, the participants said this is a more than 50 years since they wanted to, to you know, have this standard data collection and analysis in the lab. Then we identified uh, experts, senior experts, who can contribute in developing a guideline, a standard uh, data analysis collection and analysis guideline. So we identified around six uh, major thematic areas, soil agronomy and soil fertility, one component, agricultural water management, another integrated water management, soil plant water analysis, soil biology, soil survey, and the cross-cutting. Cross-cutting is any data that is going to be collected from the field should have some universal attributes uh, in terms of location and some descriptions. So these six guidelines were prepared. Uh, we prepared around 10 days write shop for senior experts, three to five group for each of the, the guidelines. So that these are now ready and they have been reviewed locally and also reviewed uh, internationally thanks to the support from uh, Mike and his team uh, from CABI. The two of them are now submitted for publication because we observed they are more, more clean and ready. The others were still working on them to make sure that uh, they are useful because there was a confusion between a guideline and a manual. So some of them are too detailed and uh, not really beyond the guideline. So we needed to revise. So this is one uh, a very interesting exercise, uh, very much uh, appreciated by the ministry and senior colleagues. And then the second one is, uh, I mean, the, the, second, the next slide, please. The other one is that, the task, the coalition was like SEAT leads the coalition members and we have a task force, but we didn't have a, a place. We needed a host. So EIAR, sorry, that is not T, EIAR, uh, volunteered to provide, the, to be a host. So that means officially, yeah, the cow, the uh, coalition of the wedding is hosted by the research institute and where any development we are doing now is linked with EIR. So we have a web portal which is being developed to facilitate the data sharing visualization. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture is the key because any decision or recommendation we make should pass through the Ministry uh, and Extension Service. So they are part of the exercise. And also are we in continue engaging and collecting more data? And now the the cow members are more than 80, and also we have brought uh, some other experts, uh, data analysts, geospatial experts, and we are contributing not only on soils and uh, agronomic related issues, but also on other emerging issues. And we have been working, for example, on uh, COVID-19 and how, you know, hotspot mapping, where should we target as a priority uh, to, to in COVID? in countries where the, the economy doesn't support to, to do uh, those protections. Next slide, please. Then the, we, we have uh, several partners working with this. So CABI was instrumental in, uh, from the data ecosystem mapping across uh, different interventions. Uh, they support the data sharing uh, guideline development. I don't know if I mentioned that. Uh, the first step after the coalition was to develop a guideline that can enable us share data among the coalition members. Uh, then, then the data sharing policy development, when the government asked us uh, to develop that, we connected with CABI to support the, the, data, the policy development component. They provi provided trainings and several uh, 
awareness creations on fair data, uh, what is fair, how should we make it fair, and so on. And also they have uh, supported reviewing the various documents that we have, including the guidelines uh, and other documents, and we are also now preparing some leaflets and other materials. And we have planned now COVID uh, prevented this exercise of capacity building in different forms. Now we are trying to see on web-based uh, capacity development and trainings in the uh, beginning of September. So in addition to CABI, in addition to GIZ and uh, Gates Foundation, CABI is also providing you know, technical and you know, even sometimes financial supporting organizing training sessions. So that's instrumental for us. Uh, next slide. So ultimately, uh, I don't know if you see all of the slide. We are not only we are not collecting data for the sake of collecting and sharing. So we have some objectives, and the, the final target is to, to to develop a knowledge-based fertilizer recommendation that is size, uh, site and uh, context specific. So we have. Uh, achieved most the majority of those and we are now fine tuning the different components uh, you know because we need to make um, you know we have uh, larger data sets of course uh, thousands of data sets but to make those recommendations at farm level will not be straightforward so we have to do more more and more work and also contextualize those to different household typologies and embed or include agro advisory services which we have already developed with uh, in Institute of Agriculture Research. So this is advanced and we are now lucky that uh, the excellence in agronomy being coordinated by IITA has selected uh, Ethiopia to be one of the use cases. This exercise, what we are doing with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Digital Green. So we'll be able to do some more uh, along that line. Uh, and also still we are collecting the data and that I hope will be available. Uh, we have some remaining data sets that are going to be collected and we are also collecting data on the ground for fine tuning the, the models or the prediction tools that we are, we are going to develop. I think these are briefly some of the experiences uh, we have along the, the coalition of the wheeling in Ethiopia and uh, we have so many presentations and slides. Uh, and if you need details, we can provide that. And Mike also knows uh, some of our activities we have done. So thanks a lot for, for the offer and uh, good luck. Thank you, Dr. Losagad. It was very inspirational. <clears throat> um, okay, thank you so much uh, colleagues for hanging on. I know we are six minutes over the time. Um, I just want to share with you some, uh, link, some few links so that you can, access more, um, you can access all the material that we've been talking about. So specifically the uh, summary of the research, or desktop research we've done and the a link to the Kumu data ecosystem map for you to also give your comment and feedback. These uh, documents will be opened next week for comment. Ooh. that link but you know I, I, I really uh, wonder why people are not putting any questions is you have unless I'm not seeing them but um, um, please use this link this is the link Mike was talking about um, this will show you um, the summary of the Rwanda desk research report um, the document with the draft data sharing principles and then after this women I are going to follow up with you if you don't mind um, in that folder, you will see a link to sign up if you want to have more conversations around this. Okay, so we can really flesh out um, this landscape uh, phase of, our, of the project. Um, and then we will be calling on, calling on, on you for more webinars like this, uh, more hands-on webinars. We would like to do a workshop style and really try and validate um, the data ecosystem. <clears throat>